Welcome to First Fuel, a podcast bringing you perspectives on the role of energy efficiency, energy management and demand response in the energy transition taking place in Australia and around the world. I'm Luke Menzel, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council, and this week I'm joined by Alan Pears, AM, Senior Industry Fellow at RMIT University, a long-standing Senior Advisor to the Energy Efficiency Council, as well as many other organisations. Um, and then, Alan, you have so many hats, I'm not sure how long this biography would go on if I actually tried to list them. Um, how about we just uh, start by saying welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So, Alan, you have been a tireless advocate of energy efficiency's role in the energy transition for, I think, over 40 years. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes. It's been a, a long journey. So a lot of people would know you from around the traps, um, but not everyone would know how you developed your passion for this subject. Um, I thought it might be good to start off this episode by having you tell us how you first developed your passion for the demand side. Right, well, it, it was kind of accidental, really. Um, so I, uh, I did study mechanical engineering uh, in the uh, early 70s, uh, when the environment was becoming an issue and uh, at Monash where I was there were uh, I guess the first politically oriented environmental groups that I kind of hung around the edge of. Uh, I did a bit of work with a consumer group uh, on transport issues uh, but by the time I finished my engineering degree I kind of had worked out that I actually didn't want to be an engineer mm. so uh, that meant me meant I, I did a diploma of education as a way of getting a broad education quickly. Right. Uh, and then that, that meant, well, the only way I could fund that was to take what used to be called a studentship, which meant I had to teach for a while to pay mm. them back. So I became a secondary school teacher. And that was the time of, of the uh, OPEC oil embargo mm. and people suddenly getting very interested in, in uh, energy issues. Um, so, so I sort of had an interest and awareness as a science teacher uh, and someone with an interest in the environment um, that that kind of went that far. Um, but what then happened? I, I then, after I left teaching, I was involved in community activism and community development, alternative education kind of projects and things. And uh, one day some people wandered in uh, and said, oh, um, look, we're, we're doing this submission to a Victorian government inquiry into energy and resource conservation. This is 1976. Mm. And, and we need someone to write a bit on how community action like neighbourhood houses and community gardens and things like that can play a role in developing a sustainable energy future for Victoria. And they seemed like nice people. So, <laughs> so I, um, I said, oh, okay. Um, and I kind of got sucked in from there because that became my apprenticeship in energy. Mm. And that led to a book called Seeds for Change, Creatively Confronting the Energy Crisis, uh, which was published by the predecessor of uh, Environment Victoria, the Conservation Council of Victoria. Uh, and basically, while doing all the work on that book, because I ended up, you know, co-writing several chapters because we didn't couldn't find people, and then our editor walked out halfway through, so I edited half the book. Uh, so I was pretty engaged with it, and mm. essentially, I became very convinced that if we did not sort out energy, uh, society would be in deep trouble. Mm. So that was that was the kind of the genesis of it. Uh, but of course, that was all community work. Uh, and then, uh, so can I, I just saying, can I just stop sorry. you there, Alan? Um, so this the book Seeds of Change, um, which I heard I hadn't heard of before, but um, I uh, I learnt all about it. Uh, Environment Victoria's fiftieth anniversary celebration mm -hmm. that was held mm -hmm. just a few months ago. Um, and when you say you had an apprenticeship, my my impression of the book is that it covered. Um, the, the, the topic of sustainability and energy from a whole range of different perspectives. And so you, you, you learnt um, and were forced as an editor to get your head around um, all, uh, uh, what is a, well, you know, a relatively complex 
uh, topic from, from, as I say, all those different perspectives. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. And you're right. It was a very comprehensive uh, coverage from urban planning, buildings, industry, um, transport, um, you, you name it. Uh, and, and in particular, I guess what was interesting for me is that I, I guess I came into energy from a community action and education perspective. Mm. And I just happened to have an engineering degree as well. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so, I, yeah, I became kind of the front person for, for that team that, that did Seeds for Change, which is how I actually got my first job in mm. energy. And that was running the Energy Information Centre, which at the time was run by the Gas and Fuel Corporation. Um, uh, we had a fantastic display centre in the city uh, with all the latest gadgets and, you know, compact fluorescent lamps and uh, solar technologies and stuff like that. Uh, and we ran an education program with, for schools. We had an, a caravan unit that used to go all around Victoria all the time. Um, and that was when I learned a lot about communication, marketing, and uh, how to get inside people's brains, I guess, uh, mm. which has been a key factor in how I've looked at energy and energy policy. And it's a, it's a really interesting point that you make that you had the mechanical engineering background, but then we're coming at it from the perspective of, of uh, community action and then actually having that, uh, and that uh, experience of working out how you motivate, motivate people to act. Um, and so often um, you've got one side of the conversation, the, the technical side or, or indeed the other side of the conversation is, you know, wanting everybody to do something, but it's actually quite challenging to, to bring those things together. Um, and something which I suppose has been a thread throughout the rest of your career. Well, well exactly. And again, because I came from this direction, um, my, my interest all the, all the time has been that interplay between people who use energy, people who make decisions about energy and the technologies. Um, and so uh, if you look at I mean, some of the, what, what happened when, when the Kane Labor government was elected in 1982, late 82, they brought in a very progressive energy uh, policy, which actually had been developed with a lot of engagement with the community movement. Mm. Uh, and so one of the things they did was say, oh, the Energy Information Centre shouldn't be run by an energy utility, it should be part of the department. So I and my team got moved across to the department and then they immediately pushed me upstairs to do program and policy work. Mm. Um, so uh, that was yeah, good and bad. So mm. that was through the 1980s, basically from 83 to 91, I worked in the Victorian government and uh, the sorts of things I was able to do because I mean, it was, it was a very positive environment, at least in the early years. Um, so I, I developed the program and did all the training for what we think was the world's first computer-based home energy assessment service with retrofitting. Mm. Uh, that was 1983. We actually had these tiny little computers that had four color printers and were not much different in size from an iPad and had 16K of memory. <laughs> And we did a full assessment, producing a personalised pie chart and hints and advice. We also, because it was run by the government, we actually had access to the gas and electricity data for each household. So we had a little feature that so that if the assessment was more than 10% different from the energy billing history, the computer would beep at them. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the assessor would, and this is very interesting because people often don't tell you the truth, right? And it's yes. not because they're trying to lie. It's often because they don't know or they're trying to answer things the way you would, they think you would like to hear them. Mm. And so this, this, this uh, little, little beep would, would go off and um, then the assessor would politely say, oh, look, I must have misheard you on something. Can we just go back over this? So it was actually pretty pretty powerful tool yeah right yeah right so alan pierce at the vanguard of uh building energy analytics back in the early 80s yep <laughs> and of course the the thing i went on to next from there was appliance energy labeling mm. and uh 
we Victorians that, well, the New South Wales government had done a lot of work to try to get energy labelling up. Uh, it had originally been energy policy uh, in New South Wales in 1979. So they'd been doing a lot of work trying to get national processes and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and we kind of came in late and said, oh, we need a promotional label, uh, which is my kind of background. And uh, there was actually quite a bizarre thing because we, we sent a pr proposal around that used uh, a gas efficiency label, which the gas industry had voluntarily introduced in Victoria. Uh, as an example of a promotional label. Uh, the State Electricity Commission's CEO, I believe, was on the phone very quickly to our minister saying, look, you know we've opposed appliance labelling for a long time, because we think it's the beginning of the death spiral for the electricity industry. Um, but look, <laughs> uh, we're, we're prepared to work with the government on one condition, and the condition is that the label looks nothing like the gas label. Mm. Uh, which again highlights the dynamics of the competitive market, I guess. Um, mm. So anyway, so then, you know, we had to find a different way of communicating uh, efficiency and the star rating, which of course was stolen from the hotel industry, uh, was market researched and was really, really successful. Um, so we sort of went from there. So that was, you know, that was quite... That was illuminating and coming back to your point about my combination of the sort of education, communication, engagement and, and energy, uh, I was in a very good position because I could talk with all of the engineers from the appliance industry yep. and find out what they thought and why they thought them. It. And then I could have that dialogue and then I would be the one who went in and negotiated with the industry guys and I knew a lot more about their appliances than they did because they were all the managers uh, so yeah it's it's been interesting to be in this kind of funny cross-cultural space well, it's being able to speak those different languages it's almost being bi or trilingual isn't it alan because you there is that conversation that we we need to have with um public servants and bureaucrats and 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 uh, ministers and and secretaries and the people that are making decisions and they're not they don't necessarily have a technical background um and then there's as you say the conversation invariably you have to have with industry which does um and you've got to find the the common ground in the venn diagram where, where everybody can come to uh particularly when we when you're making policy come to a point where there's a broad consensus around a pathway forward it may not be that everybody's thrilled with every aspect but that there's 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 agreement that uh that uh, this is overall going to be a net benefit for society um, and that really requires that that uh, ability to speak those different languages to, to to get everybody to that common ground yeah i i think that the key thing again and this is something that that is really important all the time is to find out whose opinion people trust mm. and to be able to make sure that, that those trusted networks are sending the right messages. And in fact, a good example in the technology dimension uh, in the appliance efficiency was that um, the general view among appliance manufacturing engineers was that you couldn't make fridges much more than 15% more efficient than they already were. And we were trying to get a label up that to get you know, five or six stars, you would have to get 50% savings. So we had some quite interesting technical dialogue uh, and, and won the engineers over. So the engineers, instead of saying to the managers, look, what they're saying is mad, it's impossible. Yep. Yep. They said, oh, well, yeah, if you gave us enough resources, we could do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and were you taking guidance from sort of jurisdictions like California that had been early movers on things like appliance standards? Were you aware of that and kind of trying to implement that in an Australian context? Uh, yes, in the sense that I, I think that the New South Wales government people probably came up with the idea of energy labelling based on what had happened in the US and Canada in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you go back to the oil embargo of the 70s, uh, a lot of the electricity was generated using oil in the US. Mm. 
and also they were using oil for home heating and things like that. So an oil crisis in the 1970s was essentially a, a total disaster across all forms of energy. Uh, so that's where you're right, the US, uh, particularly through Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, which is based in California, and the Californian government under Jerry Brown, who came back recently for another great round. Story. It's uh, a great story. That, you know, they, they did a lot of fantastic work and we certainly relied on some of their work to, to convince the engineers. So, Alan, was it from state government that you ended up at RMIT? Oh, no. Um, I, I actually left the Victorian government in 1991, uh, just after I'd managed to shepherd through the building energy regulations for mm. Victoria. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because, again, what you see is the interesting things in bureaucracies where, in fact, um, I was implementing government policy to bring in insulation regulations, but uh, the senior management in the industry department opposed it. Mm, mm. So I was in a very uncomfortable space for quite a while as I delivered government policy. And uh, <laughs> I stayed long enough to get it locked in so they couldn't withdraw it. And then uh, left government and set up a little uh, consulting business with a friend of mine, uh, Bro Sheffield Brotherton, who at the time was vice president of the Australian Conservation Foundation and had worked in the yeah. energy department in Victoria for a while. Um, and so S Sustainable Solutions was our, was our business from 1991 until just a few years ago. Uh, and we basically worked out of our dining rooms with our $5,000 laptops and a fax machine and a phone answering machine. Uh, and uh, worked on a lot of amazing projects uh, mm -hmm. on energy and climate action from the early 90s onwards. And then RMIT, uh, essentially around the year 2000 was my climate trauma where I'd kind of decided that that was when we would really know the science was in. Uh, <laughs> Yep. And so it was like, oh, we're going to need more people if we win. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I did have some contacts at RMIT. And so I started teaching there part time and also working with their Centre for Design, uh, which was a cross cultural design. Um, and yeah, so I taught there for uh, 15 years part time, but I made sure that I only stayed part time um, because the academic culture is a pretty uh, challenging one. Uh, and also there were lots of consulting things and unpaid projects I wanted to do as well. So I, I was working on, for instance, during that period, energy efficiency opportunities and the energy, uh, energy efficiency best practice programs. I was doing work with CEDA, the Sustainable Energy Development Authority in New South Wales. Um, so I, I was, in fact, I, I think I was much more useful to the students, really, because I could tell them what was really going on and uh, give them a lot of up-to-date sort of perspectives. Also, I consciously chose to teach in the social science environment program, not engineering or science, because uh, my view is that the real shortage we have is actually in the soft side of driving change rather than mm. the technology side. Mm. And I suppose if I think about some of the other things, just to, to round off this very brief uh, pricey of your career, um, there is the, the regular column you've been writing in Renew. Um, is that, that's over 20 years now that's been going? Uh, 1997, yeah. yeah. There so, you go. Um, 23. Um, I'm getting towards my 100th issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look. Yeah, I, by the way, there the Renew's got it. You know, for five dollars, you can get a, um, a, an ebook that's got that that that's got all my um, my columns and eight sort of thematic articles yes. reflecting on how naively optimistic I was in many cases. <laughs> uh, but look, on in in others, I was way ahead of everyone else. You know? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And that's why I, I raise it, actually. So for anyone that has um, just in this brief discussion had their interest peaked um, around Alan's career and, and all the various 
uh, ins and outs of uh, government policy and, and technology development that he's observed and in some some in many cases in fact contributed to um, I reckon that that's probably the best five dollars anybody could ever spend Alan, because um, certainly a, certainly a uh, uh, a collection I've worked my way through, and I was just looking at over over it in preparation for our chat today, and think, well, gee, you've you've, you've sort of you're the Forrest Gump of energy efficiency. I think you've you've sort of seen everything over, over the journey, and um, and it's a it's a it's a really impressive legacy. And the fact that you were kind of covering it in Renew every every quarter for all of those years means you can kind of see some of those themes emerge in real time, um, and then get frustrated that some of the things that uh, we you knew were an issue, you know, 15 years ago still haven't been resolved. <laughs> yeah. which is probably not a bad segue really <laughs> if we look to uh if we look to some of the uh, the conversations that we're having having at the minute and of course um last week with chloe munro uh ellen uh, we were reflecting on the new re- newly released um uh technology investment roadmap consultation paper uh you know i think we'd had it for five or six hours uh, when i was chatting to chloe and I think uh, Chloe Chloe provided some immediate uh, uh, takes, um, a hot take, uh, but then was looking forward to your input on on some of the thornier thornier issues, including how you translate, um, you know, a technology vision and innovation vision around technology to something which encompasses deployment. Without without leading the leading the interviewee too much, I'm wondering, Alan, if you could start us off by just giving us your reactions having had a few days to digest the technology investment roadmap what's what are your thoughts well i I think it's it's a useful discussion paper but it's Mm. not a policy framework or much more i mean essentially it's a review it's an update of csiro's study of a few years ago Mm -hmm. where they do look at the relative uh, level of development, uh, costs of avoided carbon and scale of potential savings or, or emission reductions that you might get from a whole range of different technology solutions. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's very useful. But of course, technology is only one element of the energy and the climate story. Um, I, you know, I keep saying to everyone, look, people don't want energy, you know, and they actually don't want technology either. You know, like today you can download a movie using one set of technology. What you used to have to do was hop in another piece of technology called your car and drive up to the video store and, you know, hire a DVD or a video and then come home and play in another piece of technology and so on. Like the the reality is no one really wants particular technologies. They are trying to look for services and... So that's one reason why I do focus so much on on the consumer and the dimension of of the markets in the retail space and the fact that there are many markets at work and forces at work outside the energy sector that are driving the demand for energy uh, and that can go up or down. And that's one reason why I'm right into digitalization uh, and, and connected systems, uh, mm. which we might maybe get onto later. But coming back to the paper, it's, it's a useful piece of work. But uh, I guess what I found interesting is that they do have a figure from the International Energy Agency where they list across every sector the issues that are not on track, more effort is needed and are on track. And, yes, uh, yes, yes. I love that one as well. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> it honestly, enough, but most, a lot of the non, not on track and more effort needed ones happen to be energy efficiency measures. Yes, that's uh, right. Likewise, uh, if you go into Appendix B, and, and actually there's a good lesson here, whenever you read a government document, you should always read the appendices mm. and you should always read the fine print because often the early parts of the document and the summary are written by the political people and they may say the exact opposite of what is really in the report. So you need to keep that in mind. So in that case, uh, you know, in, in Appendix B, they've got sector by sector, the, yep. all the analyses of a lot of the technologies. And I think one of the challenges we have in terms of where do we take the discussion that comes from this document is that there are a lot of negative cost 
abatement actions in Appendix B that somehow don't make it to the selected list in the main document. Um, yep. And the reality is a lot of those negative cost ones are energy efficiency and demand side things. And a lot of them are, are very cost effective, but non-financial barriers and institutional barriers and cultural mm. barriers are what's blocking them. So if government is going to develop and implement a least cost climate response strategy, uh, a lot of it is going to be about non-technical, non-traditional economic issues. Uh, mm. And, you know, that's traditionally been a very difficult issue. And I think that's where uh, we have to come up with much better narratives. And I think we have to frame energy efficiency more as uh, a key element of a toolkit that can deliver what people want or value or as part of a narrative to change their mind so they realise what they should value and, and want. Yeah. Sure, and it's something, I think it's something that's really evolved in our work at the Energy Efficiency Council over the last five years is that we, we don't talk a lot about efficient homes anymore. For example, we talk about healthy, comfortable homes, uh, homes that are warm in winter and, and cool in summer, which, is, which goes to the, the, your you know, very good point that um, we need to think about what people value, what services they're willing to invest in and pay for. Um, uh, and the and I suppose the challenge for all of us that are passionate about energy efficiency is that realization that I'm sure you had very early, Alan, which I I had at some point in the last decade, which was um, we're actually we're actually talking about very different things in different parts of the economy. Yep. So energy efficiency as a meta narrative works for uh, uh, you know a a government department. And, and if you're a technical expert in the space, then you kind of get, you know, how that principle plays out in different contexts. But if you're a consumer, whether you're a, a business or a household, energy efficiency doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's talking about what a, a, a prudent approach to managing your energy use um, uh, can deliver for you on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's uh, productivity or, or amenity or, or whatever it is. Um, and then the it's and it's particularly important given how um, bounded these sort of these energy efficiency measures are to particular sectors of the economy that we have that granular conversation um, because you know you can go get a long way with um, with sort of relatively um, cheap homogenous technology like solar without necessarily having to have kind of finicky conversations with different sectors of the economy because the solar panel on the, the roof of your house or on the roof of a warehouse or indeed sort of sitting out in the paddock somewhere at, at a larger scale. It's kind of the same thing and people can get their head around it. But, you know, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, what energy efficiency means in a, in a home versus a manufacturing facility, you, you need a much more tailored conversation. Yeah, and, and you're right that, I mean, for a lot of the decision makers, energy is a relatively minor component of the important mm. factors. And yep. I mean, with A2EP, the work, work we've done with the refrigerated cold chain is a good example where we've worked out, look, the supermarkets drive all this, what do supermarkets care about? Not losing food, yep. extending shelf life, and not making people sick or killing them. Yep. You know, that's pretty much it. And now the point is that once we started talking about that, that is worth, you know, 20 times as much as the energy costs. And also, uh, we can then say, well, actually, the way we can help you is we will use all of these technologies and uh, techniques to identify poor practices and all of these things. Oh, and, you know, look, we'll save you all this money on wasted food and improve your business productivity. And, oh, and look, you'll save a few hundred million on energy as well. Um, yep. And that, that worked pretty well. Um, I think going back to your point about, about the diversity of all of this, of energy efficiency, um, the, in 2010, the Rudd government commissioned a task group on energy efficiency. Yep. Uh, and in that report, there is a flowchart of the governance structures driving energy efficiency in Australia. And 
you would have to describe it as a brilliant spaghetti diagram. And when you look at that, what you see is that a lot of the people who are involved in decision making about energy efficiency have no interest in it whatsoever and may have very different agendas and priorities. And so, I mean, one of the problems we face with energy efficiency is we do not have a focal point uh, that is powerful and well enough resourced and run by people who know what they're talking about in the same way as, as most other areas of policy have within, you know, the institutional structures. Um, and that, that is a really serious failure uh, in, in terms of, uh, well, institutional design. Mm -hmm. And look, it goes to your experience um, uh, back in the 80s and 90s about, you know, departments working at cross purposes. And even last week with Chloe Munro, she was hearkening back to her days as a, as a secretary in a Victorian department in the yeah. 90s and saying that they were discussing exactly the same things and she was expressing a certain amount of, uh, of disappointment that we were still having the same conversation, but it, it is absolutely true. Um, we do have different parts of government working in, in different directions and we see, um, for example, the interaction between the Coag Energy Council that are thinking about buildings as a, 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 a en masse um, and their impact on the, the grid over time um, um, versus uh, the building ministers forum, which is thinking about, you know, the particular implications of certain policy settings for uh, a set of stakeholders that are very focused really on the, on, on construction of new, new build. Um, and those two don't, those two things don't necessarily match up very well. And um, it sort of it reminds me, you know, we mentioned California already, uh, Alan, and it, it sort of, uh, always like to drop in a reference um, to the California Energy Commission and one of the innovations of that that uh, sort of forward-thinking governor, um, Jerry, Jerry Brown, in how he shaped the role of that commission, you know, encompassing um, both um, uh, energy, energy appliance standards and, and building standards and also having the CEC having a clear role in thinking about the relative merit of of regulation around standards versus investment in supply side infrastructure. Um, Cause they're not, they're parallel conversations, but they're, <laughs> they shouldn't be. They, they, they're directly interrelated. Um, if you don't deal with some of those demand side regulatory issues, then you, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to end up needing to build more generation assets. But, but again, you need to think of it more in terms of not just regulatory. Cause I remembered, uh, was it Diane Grunick from, California was out a few times some years back talking about how they just changed the way energy retailers are rewarded mm -hmm. and basically they would set a threshold and if they went above that threshold in total sales they would lose money and if they went below it they would get exponentially more money um, and you know that Again, if you look at if you look at uh, the Victorian Energy Upgrade Scheme, the New South Wales Energy Savings Scheme, you know we can see retail obligations work and can influence a market. It's just that the present ones are so unambitious that uh, you know we we're not making as much progress as we could. Mm. So going back to your original point around the technology investment roadmap and, and some of the, the technologies that, you know, perhaps aren't giving, being given as much prominence as people that are passionate about the areas that you and I uh, might like. Um, or there is a, there is some interesting commentary that I've been reflecting on as I've sort of gone through the, the roadmap in more detail around um, low cost technologies or negative cost technologies and, um, the the lack of deployment of those technologies, even where they're commercially available in the Australian market. And I can't remember the exact phrase, phrase Alan, but I think they said more analysis is needed to work out exactly why that might be. <laughs> I'd well, like you to comment on that, Alan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, we, we do know why a lot of these things are not being adopted. Um, and a lot of it is just simply no budget, <laughs> mm. uh, let alone lack of, senior leadership both within you know public sector organizations the energy sector let alone politics mm. um and and i think this is where uh it it's interesting to to look at things like the fact that every year we get 
a statement of opportunities published by AEMO for the electricity industry and the gas industry, highlighting the issues that are emerging and how well they're going and what might be a, a risk or a crisis and all of that kind of thing. And, um, you know, a, a very small step in the right direction would be for us to have a demand side energy efficiency statement of opportunities every year because that would actually mean they have to actually employ a few more people to do the work to be mm. able to write a coherent document each year and to actually track what was going on. Mm. We don't even have that. Mm. Mm. And do you think that that is a role that should be taken up by AEMO or is, there, is, is that better left with another body, um, either existing or to be created? Yeah, well, I think there's two things. I, I think that we need a lot more than an annual statement of opportunities on the demand side. Um, that, but that would be a beginning. Mm. And I think, you know, I mean, my dealings with AEMO is that they do have some good people who are interested in the demand side. Um, and in fact, I, in a public forum, I, I raised a point about the, the most recent uh, statement of opportunities on electricity, where when you look at the executive summary, you see that everything is relative to what they call their neutral scenario, I think. But if you go right into the depths of the document, you find there are actually five scenarios. And by 2040, the difference in electricity demand between the lowest one and the highest one is 55% difference. And one of the points I made in, in well, making a lot of talks I, I do, I put that up and I say, AEMO are our best energy forecasters and they don't know what's going to happen to demand. And just as, you know, if I sell toothpaste, I'm very interested to understand how people use toothpaste and why they use as little or as much and how I can make them like mine more and all of that. The energy supply sector is astoundingly ignorant of the complexities of the forces at work that are shaping future demand. Well, I just, I'm astounded by it. I just don't understand. I, um, you know, <laughs> mm. so, so I think a statement of opportunities every year uh, would be good. And I think, I, I mean, my sense of it is that the culture of AEMO, you know, particularly with, you know, people like Audrey Zimmelman who do understand demand side stuff mm -hmm. uh, and a number of the people that I've met from AEMO, they could certainly produce an annual demand side efficiency statement of opportunities if the resources were allocated. Now, mm -hmm. it's another thing to say then what, what would emerge in terms of actual outcomes once they publish that. But, you know, that's, that's a step forward. And I think that's where, again, I come back to that spaghetti diagram uh, from the 2010 Energy Efficiency Task Group. Uh, until you've got a clear, visible focus where the people are competent, well-resourced, and able to drive directed policy and directed programs, uh, you will have what we've got now, which is failure. And I think that's, again, we need to start understanding the cost of this failure. And again, um, the International Energy Agency publishes now every year a very good document on energy efficiency and trends and issues. Mm -hmm. It's it's a great read and it's a free download. Indeed, we uh, had uh, Brian Motherway on the on the podcast the just day, a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one of the really interesting graphs in that is that they look at, that they basically say, look, we think that it's technically and economically sensible uh, and practical to achieve three percent per annum improvement in energy efficiency globally. They then have a graph in this most recent one where they actually show that over the last three or so years, the cost to the global economy of the failure to achieve that 3% per annum improvement has been $25 trillion US. Now, 
we've got 1.2% of that, presumably, if we're average, and I suspect we're below average in performance on energy efficiency. So we are talking about tens of billions of dollars a year adverse impacts just based on that one approach to, to looking at the situation. Um, you know, so it's costing us a lot of money to fail on energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. I think this, really the, thing, yeah, the thing that strikes me about the, the your idea of a energy efficiency statement of opportunities that is that would help us to quantify the size of the prize and also progress over time. That would be incredibly, in, incredibly valuable, um, and would help build a case for the sort of um, institutional architecture um, that your you're highlighting as necessary a properly resourced sort of uh, arm of government, which is is focused on tapping into these opportunities. And we know they're there. We know that the jurisdictions that have had some success in in unlocking that opportunity, like Germany and and uh, and California and others, um, have done so by you know painstaking and, and careful policy making over decades. Um, this is something that you need to be committed to over over time. You can you, there's obviously quick wins um but it's 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 uh, uh or a, a relatively complex space that requires sustained attention right yeah but i i think you need you need some separation and independence as well and i think i mean if we reflect back on the role that, that CEDA, the new south wales sustainable energy development authority played under kathy zoy the import from California, mm, yep. uh, you know, they they introduced green power. They introduced uh, what's now the neighbours rating scheme. I helped them with a very good business energy efficiency program. Uh, Chris Dunstan did an enormous amount of work questioning the culture and the and the focus on poles and wires of the distribution systems. Uh, you know. CEDA did great stuff. Likewise, I think another interesting example uh, is Energy Consumers Australia. And Energy Consumers Australia have done a lot of fantastic market research, uh, sophisticated analysis of how things work. Uh, and I, I think ECA can take a fair bit of the, the credit for uh, this shifting of the framing of building energy efficiency in the residential sector towards safe, affordable, comfortable, healthy buildings. Yep. Uh, I mean, they ran uh, a one day summit nearly two years ago. And the communique that came out of that hardly mentioned energy efficiency, but that's really what it was all about. And it had, uh, you know, 40 logos of a whole range of social justice, health care, community organisations uh, and that that has really reframed the debate you know I mean as someone who's tried to do building energy policy since the 1980s this the narrowness has been so frustrating uh, I was on the steering committee for introduction of the first national uh, building energy regulations and I tried to get them to factor in a whole lot of other factors like health health and peak demand and all these kinds of issues and I totally failed the one the one consolation prize I was given there was a table of a whole list of factors with not considered not considered not considered uh, in, in one of the documents so at least they acknowledged that they were being narrow in their analysis but uh. it didn't get anywhere yeah, and I should I should probably probably say that Energy Consumers Australia, established by Coag Energy Council to represent the interests of uh, I guess small businesses and and households who uh, uh, were identified as being underrepresented in conversations around uh, energy markets and particularly energy market reform. And as you say, Alan, um, have played a, a really pivotal role in in taking some of the issues that uh, that people like you and I have been banging on about for, for many, many years um, and turning them into a uh, consumer protection issue and rallying consumer groups around the cause, um, not just because of energy affordability, although that is, a, that is obviously a crucial issue, particularly for vulnerable groups, but um, um, because of comfort and, and, and health and amenity as well. 
Um, well, and, and safety. I mean, I think, safety. you know, one of the classic things is if you're an elderly person in a west facing high apartment, high up in a tall building and mm. the power goes out, will you die? Mm. Mm. That, that does mobilize politicians, I believe. Mm. Mm. So we're, we're, we're ranging pretty far and wide, but to, to just bring it back to the technology roadmap for a moment, I, I think your view sort of accords with ours, which is that, uh, in and of itself, it, it's a it's a valuable contribution. But I, I suppose what what we're hoping for, um, either either in the in the final roadmap or indeed in in uh, associated uh, documents and initiatives, is some some careful thinking about how we uh, do unlock those deployment pathways for the technology that we have now. Um, it strikes me that the the paper has a, a understandable focus on the medium and long-term technology that we're going to need to decarbonise, um, which is where a lot of the exciting technological innovation is going to happen. Um, but the reality is that, that we have a, a whole bunch of technology, particularly when it comes to electrification in the building space, which we need to start really deploying at scale right now. And that is what, um, in my view at least, Ellen, uh, is going to give us the headroom we need so that we can really work through some of the some of the bigger challenges we have in harder to abate sectors. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I disagree with you a bit about having all the technology. I mean, we have, we basically have lots of the technologies and things like that, but there's lots more to be done. I mean, you know, I've actually invested quite a lot of my spare time over the last year or so modifying a benchtop oven so that it's super efficient and then discovering that because it heats up in five minutes instead of half an hour, I've had to change all my cooking times. And uh, there are a whole lot of issues that have emerged that I didn't know about. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I think I think we need to focus much more. And again, I, I'm doing work with some councils at the moment on heat pumps for aquatic centres. Yep. We have lots of engineers who don't understand how heat pumps work. And we have unresolved debates within the air conditioning and refrigeration industries about which refrigerants are best under what circumstances. And there's, there's plenty of work to be done with a lot of so-called mature technologies. Likewise, I mean, if we look at the building, the residential building space and, and the, well, the whole building space, especially with the COVID-19 issue of maybe people wanting to pump more fresh air in, but also um, with changing climate and extreme weather, energy recovery ventilation systems are going to be really important. And yes, the Europeans have done a lot of work in that space, but we, we have nothing much yet in in those kinds of spaces so as far as i'm concerned there's there's a long list of things that would help us to make a lot of things we know are good things and, and that we've got basic technologies for but we need to actually make them fit into the paradigms that people are uh, thinking about and using as as decision making factors and things like that so there's there's an enormous amount of work to be done that I, I just think is not recognised. Well, look, I, I think I was wondering what you'd pulled me up on in, over the course of this podcast, <laughs> Helen, and uh, I'm glad it was that because um, it, it's true. It's probably me saying, oh, we have the technology. That's probably a CEO talking because we need to rally the troops. Um, you're right. There's a, there, there are challenges to be worked through. I guess my point would be my more nuanced point in the building space is that the technology challenges aren't as great in the building space as they are in other sectors when it comes to abatement um, and that to the degree that we need innovation, it's innovation, um, you know, in, on all the, along parallel paths. So yes, there's some technology issues we need to work through, but it's also, as you say, innovation in, in business models, um, in what you've called, Alan, social, cultural and institutional barriers so we can develop those practical implementation models. And so it's kind of thinking about how, how how will those systems interact to, de to deliver a deployment outcome, right? Yeah, and I, I, I think that's where the digitalization and connection thing is really exciting. And in fact, the International Energy Agency's latest energy efficiency report has got a whole chapter on digitalization. Mm, but yep. for, for me, for me, digitalization is beginning to offer us the ability to provide the right information in the right form at the right time 
for the right person and also help us build a more credible business case based on real data, not engineering estimates, which I'm afraid lots of people don't trust very well, mm. uh, for good reason. Uh, so there's that. I think the other thing that we found, this is with the Alliance for Energy Productivity, with our work with um, what, what I've called value chains, mm. is mm. that a lot of the energy efficiency potential comes as product moves through the value chain or the supply chain yep. and passes between groups within companies and companies themselves. So, for example, if the food temperature goes up when it's in the truck, yep. then the supermarket has to use a lot more energy to bring that food back down to temperature. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they've lost uh, shelf life mm -hmm. and they may even have a health risk. Mm -hmm. So I, the thing to me is uh, the more I've looked at, at the digitalization, the more I think we can get around some of the big barriers because the, the cost and complexity of a lot of things like submetering is a really big barrier. Yep. But if you've got digital analytics and machine learning and a smart, data nerd, not an energy nerd, a data nerd, yes, yes, <laughs> um, yes. you can identify astounding things that are going on and that are anomalous and can point you towards what might actually be a poor practice yes, or a faulty appliance yes, or someone not having understood the complexity of the feedback systems and interactions within a technological system. And we should um, we should uh, link well, to that's some. What I'm counting on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, uh, we should link to some of those very good reports that you and and John Judson and, and Chris Dunstan and others over the, the uh, Alliance for Energy Productivity have produced over the last um, over the last few years because um, they do go to that point of it. It's almost systems thinking, isn't it? It's it's the way that a product moves through. Uh, what you're calling a value chain and the opportunities that digitalization opens up to track that movement so that it's, it's moving through the value chain as efficiently and productively as possible, which delivers all kinds of benefits for the company. It's kind of the win-win-win of um, energy resource and process efficiency, which is um, delivering a level of value, value that uh, businesses simply won't be able to ignore. Yeah, and I think the other thing about the digitalization, so a lot of technical people do the digitalization from the individual process and site upwards. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be said for doing it from the top back downwards because what you can then do is bring in a whole lot of different data streams. And for example, we, we did a project, this was energy efficiency best practice um, with, with a supermarket chain where we analyzed, we did multiple regression analysis on uh, some supermarkets. Each supermarket only had one meter, but the, but the supermarket chain knew the floor areas, how much refrigeration equipment, what kind, whether they had airlocks, uh, whether they were freestanding, they had lots of information and the, the multiple regression analysis, which is really what a lot of the data analytics is, um, allowed us to identify what factors seem to make a big difference. Mm. They mm. don't necessarily tell you the technological details. So, I mean, in that case, one of the things we found was that airlocks on supermarkets were really, really a good idea. Mm. But then you have to ask the question, which is where some technology understanding comes in. Well, why is an airlock such a good idea? <laughs> and of course, it's blocking a lot of the outdoor air moving into the building along mm. with water vapour and dust and a whole bunch of other things. So it shows up as, uh, as a really worthwhile thing to do. But that's not necessarily what you might have thought. Mm. Mm. And it, 
It really, we, we're talking in another way of another another set of silos, aren't we? Around you know um, groups within organisations or, or organisations themselves that are kind of they have a there's a chain of custody there and they look after their little bit, but don't worry about the next bit or indeed the interrelationship between their bit and the next bit, and that's where a lot of I guess the productivity losses occur, right? Exactly, and that again is why framing it as a productivity thing, I think, is actually helpful because mm. when you talk about energy efficiency, everyone sort of says, "Oh, I might save some money on energy. Oh, that might be half a percent of my business costs." Once you're talking about the sorts of things we've just been talking about, you are talking about serious productivity benefit for yep. your for your facility. And I mean, the Green Building Council's been onto this for quite some time, highlighting the enormous value of improved productivity within green buildings. Hmm. Um, so we're, we're sort of getting there, but um, the, we come back to this problem that the narrowness of the analysis uh, has failed to grasp all this. But what's, what's great about the data analytics is you can get real-time information and so if the temperature of the food is going up and you know where it is, you can ring someone and say, what's going on? And they look out the window and say, oh yeah, oh, the guys have gone off for lunch and they've left all this refrigerated food sitting on the loading dock. Well, you can fix that. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that um, we are actually just in the very early stages of an opportunity to transform uh, our capability to identify opportunities and problems uh, and to then, as I say, get solid data that people can, you know, the finance guys will actually look at mm. mm -hmm. uh, and, and also to give us the narratives to talk about the issues in the context of what people values. Because I mean, just to go on a completely different tangent, I've, I've done quite a bit of work with APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Community, looking at about 15 cities around the Asia-Pacific. And we were talking about low carbon strategies. But, you know, when you talk to all of the, the community people and the council people and all of that, they're actually talking about congestion, air pollution, slums, uh, a whole bunch of things. And that's how they frame everything. And... Mm. So they don't actually even really get why climate and energy are such important policy issues. And I think this is a thing, again, if you look at the really basic thing, again, something I often say to students, um, you know, have you looked at the fact that your mobile phone is a supercomputer uh, and that you could not have a mobile phone if you didn't have a highly efficient processor, a very low energy consuming screen, uh, and and really good battery technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is this is the demonstration of extreme energy efficiency, and it has changed your life. And again, I think one of the big differences between the demand side stuff, energy efficiency in particular, and energy supply is that energy supply just supplies your energy. Mm. Or you get angry if it doesn't. Energy efficiency is part of how life is transformed. And, you know, my, my home is pretty efficient. So when I get up on a cold winter morning, I can wander around without putting on four layers of dressing gowns. You know, it, that's nice. <laughs> yep. So I guess final thought, um, we've, we've traversed and I think built a reasonable case, uh, Alan, that um, sort of looking at these things technology by technology or, uh, and only looking at, um, I guess, the cost of the technology and assuming when it gets to be cost effective, it's going to be deployed is probably uh, not a holistic enough view of how, how change happens. Um, there is this reference in the in the technology roadmap um, around defining these stretch goals, um, and I think for for hydrogen they're talking about getting hydrogen down to under two dollars a kilogram, and defining a whole range of other stretch goals for other technologies. 
Um, a question without notice. Um, do you think for demand side technologies, there are a set of stretch goals that could usefully be defined that we could be working for? So acknowledging that we need to have a more holistic conversation around deployment. Um, is that idea around a, a cost goal for, for particular demand side technologies um, useful in, in any way, shape or form? Well, I, I don't know that we need a cost goal because we've got so much that's cost effective already. Mm, I, mm. I think what we need to do is say, um, energy consumption in Australia must decline at, at 3% per annum, according to the International Energy Agency best advice. Yep. And if we don't, then those who don't do so well might have to be charged some more and those who do better than they're expected get a reward, which mm. is exactly what uh, Angus Taylor is talking about with the safeguard mechanism at the moment. It's yep. just a question of, you know, broader application. <laughs> uh, applying it to the energy retailers as well as a whole lot of other people. Mm. Mm. Pretty simple, really. You know, and look, this is the thing. This is all about priorities, isn't it? Look, yeah. if our society thinks something's important enough, we work out ways of delivering it. The reality is they haven't thought energy efficiency is important enough, so they have not bothered to drive the institutional structures, the, the signals, uh, or the technologies. That's how it is. And I suppose it's incumbent upon us, Alan, to acknowledge the very good work that has occurred in Australia. Um, there are there are um, areas of, of uh, optimism to be had and whether you look at neighbours and, and the commercial building disclosure program which um, is, is world leading I think um, whether you look yeah, at well, the, the person who developed the framework that, for <laughs> which became neighbours that's a really good example I, I CEDA the Sustainable Energy Development Authority paid me <laughs> to do a two week round trip around the world to yes. talk to all the building regulators and leading edge and I came back with the basic message being there's this enormous gap between the design intent and the delivered performance. And so then we decided, well, okay, let's come up with a simple rating scheme that the CEO who's three years into a five year fixed contract will be able to understand star rating and uh, give them a way of achieving useful improvements during their contract period so they can use it to get more money later. Uh, and it's based on real performance. And it's, it's, it's astounding how few places have picked up on rating of buildings or anything else on real performance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazingly effective. Well, look, you've uh, given me a, a topic for a, a future podcast, which is to get you and Paul Bannister on to uh, to tell me the the history of uh, of Neighbours and its predecessors. Paul did all the hard detail work. <laughs> I did a overview structure. <laughs> um, well, I look forward to that. Um, and then you know you've got you've obviously got um, uh, energy efficiency schemes, retailer obligations in ACT South Australia. And New South Wales and Victoria, and well, I, I, I take your point um, that um, you know there's opportunities to ramp up the the ambition. Um, they have been the quiet achievers, and and I sometimes reflect on um, the angst that has uh, has uh, been at play over the last three or four years over energy price rises, and um, I think about well, what if those schemes hadn't been there, and hadn't been driving you know sensible energy efficiency upgrades over the period? How much? Yeah how much more troubling would those, those price spikes in the latter part of last decade have been? Yeah, and I, th I think it's, it's really great to see the New South Wales program building in rewards for peak demand mm. reduction. Mm. And I, I have been recommending that for quite some time to the Victorian government, by the way, and it hasn't happened. Um, so I'm glad to see New South Wales do it. But, um, you know, there's... We need to target energy efficiency better to the times when it's most valuable. Yep. And so, you know, we know if it's a hot summer afternoon and we've got peak demand, it has a lot to do with buildings, cooling equipment and, um, you know, leakiness and all sorts of things like that. So we know, we know 
how we could fix a lot of things. But again, if you look at the building code, the building code places very little emphasis on peak demand reduction, mm. which is bizarre. But there you go. <laughs> well, it's, all, it's all about where you define the scope, right, of, of, of concern and what, what issues you're willing to take on board. And, and historically, that hasn't been, that interaction with the system, the energy system, um, hasn't been yeah. one that has been set at the centre of the build, our building code. I'd argue that it's essential that it moves to the centre because, you know what, uh, uh, we're well beyond the, the point where where buildings are kind of hanging off the end of our energy system. We're into the era in which buildings are our energy system. And, and so and it's absolutely they essential. They lock, they lock in a lot of things for a long time. Yes. Um, and if they're not adaptable to changing climate, that's a problem for the future owners as well. So there's a, yeah. I, I actually think we should talk about, you know, buildings as a form of public infrastructure mm. that individuals happen to be uh, occupying and paying for at a given time. Um, because, you know, the average house has got, you know, half a dozen owners over its life. Um, and so the decisions made by the, fir the, the, the first uh, buyer who's often very uninformed and financially stressed and trying to juggle where they can afford to buy and a whole bunch of other things. Um, uh, so we're creating a problem for ourselves by failing to think about that, that societal value yeah. of a building. And sensible building regulations, they, they do have that society wide dividend and, um, and ultimately drive down the cost of many of the things that, you know, may be more expensive in, a, in the short term, but once, it, once they're deployed at scale, become very, very affordable. Yeah, and I think Chloe Munro touched on this last week about, um, you know, that well designed regulations can be very efficient and effective policy tools mm. uh, if they stop the cheap nasty guys undercutting the you know responsible competent ones and if they hold people to account for the performance of things when they have made claims about how they would perform you know there's a whole lot of things there where regulation is a perfectly in, in fact it's far more effective in a lot of cases than pricing hmm. And it's, a, it's to bring us full circle to the IEA, which you've mentioned a number of times. I remember having um, Brian Motherway out at our conference back in 2016, and the key message of his keynote presentation was that policy is crucial for energy efficiency. And when they look at the leaders and the laggards around the world when it comes to energy efficiency performance, um, the difference is policy and, uh, and putting that policy in place. Well, it's not just the policy, it's quality implementation <laughs> and commitment and sustained implementation of the policy that is also well designed yes yes absolutely alan i uh, we're on a unity ticket there well look um uh thank you thank you for our time i'm sure our listeners um will have, will have appreciated the the breadth and depth of of your knowledge and uh you know we've touched on a whole range of areas um and there's there's plenty more territory to cover i, I look forward to inviting you onto a future episode perhaps to, to pick one of those areas and, and do a deep dive um thanks for your time i, I know that you you wear various hats i i know you and you're not yet on twitter um for some reason you've decided there's more productive productive uses of your time, Alan, than to, to join us on social media. But I can tell you there's plenty of energy policy smackdowns that are occurring in that space, which I sometimes wish that you were around to, uh, to have the final word, because I reckon you'd win most of them going around. But uh, in the absence of a Twitter account, where can I point people if they want to find out more about you? Oh, dear. Uh, well, don't go to LinkedIn, because I haven't looked <laughs> Don't go to my Facebook page because I've been at that for months. Um, <laughs> e email at RMIT is probably <laughs> uh, right. a good way. Um, oh, we'll we'll uh, we'll put that we'll put that in the show notes and um, and uh, or they could they could you know email you and you could pass it on. Fair enough. I'm happy to be the filter. <laughs> Alan, Alan, thanks so much. Um, it's always a pleasure talking and uh, looking forward to uh, catching up with you again soon. And that wraps up this episode of First Fuel. If you have 
comments, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is at Luke Menzel. And if you are listening to this podcast, you should probably be following the Energy Efficiency Council to keep up to date on the latest in energy efficiency, energy management and demand response. And that handle is at EE Council. If Twitter is not your thing, you can find us on LinkedIn at eec.org.au um, or you can email us. Um, and the address is firstfuel at eec.org.au. And if you lob in an email to Ellen, uh, we'll be sure to pass it on. And if you have a moment, we'd be delighted if you'd leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. It will help other like-minded folk like you find the podcast. Uh, next week, and we've mentioned the California Energy Commission a couple of times, I'm delighted to note that uh, we will have the uh, California Energy Commissioner, Andrew McAllister, joining us to to talk about uh, energy efficiency, energy management in the California context, give us some of the history around that, but also how uh, California is responding to the COVID-19 crisis and some of the opportunities they're running the rule over when it comes to energy efficiency as a stimulus measure. So you've got that to look forward to, but for now it's goodbye from us and we'll catch you soon. <laughs>